Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. In this special Christmas episode, I've got an avian guest for you. The one and only legendary comedian Freddie Davies. So whilst you're preparing your turkey, you can listen to one of the true greats of the business. We talk in this episode about performing in a pub at 10 years old. You'll hear lots of pantomime stories his ideas for producing and directing, and a confession from a young Alan Rickman. Yes, that Alan Rickman. You can also see some of the photos that we talk about on the Instagram and Facebook pages. Just search for at Panto Podcast or one word. And for some of our younger listeners, there are some names that Freddie mentions who should definitely Google and see some of their work because they are absolutely fantastic. So please, sit back or... Prep your dinner, wrap your presents, and enjoy the latest Panto Podcast. My guest for today's Panto Podcast is comedy legend, Freddie Davies. Hello, Freddie. Hello. How are you? Fine. <laughs> it ought to be called a legend. But, I thought legends were dead. No, well, <laughs> we wouldn't say that at all, will we? <laughs> it's close. No. <laughs> How old are you now, then, if you don't mind? Oh, to hell of an age. I'll let them work it out. I was born in 1937. Are you working out yeah. quickly? <laughs> yeah. Well, in, so, so in 1980, whatever it was, uh, anyway, in 1997, I was 80. So um, I feel 180, but there you go. But you, you're looking well, to be fair. Thank you. That's what people always say to old people. Will you're looking well. Yeah. <laughs> Man, he died yesterday. By the God, he, he looks well, though, doesn't he? <laughs> Were you then a funny child? I think I was always uh, a bit different. I don't know about funny. I think, I, I think when I started um, as, as being a child, <laughs> from what I can remember, <laughs> I did used to make people laugh a lot, I think, yeah. And I started in amateur dramatics very young, seven, eight, nine. I joined the Cubs and then I went into this uh, Sunday school thing, which, which gave me the chance of actually doing a pantomime. So I did my first amateur pantomime. I think I was about 11, 11 or 12. The picture of which is behind you. It's behind me. Yes. There we go. <laughs> it's behind you. <laughs> okay. This one here. That's the one there. Brilliant. If you, if you take it, you'll see, see if you can see which which is moi. See if you can... You can me that little charming... <laughs> that's him. ...fellow down there. There he is. <laughs> I'll get a photo of this, if that's okay, and I'll put it on the... No problem. ...on the page, if that's yeah. right. Wow, sir. You would have been how old then? I think I was about 11 or 12, yeah. I remember the first joke I ever did in Panto. I had to walk across the stage, and there was a lineup of the characters. And I walked around, and I had this prop door. And the king in the Panto said to me, where are you going with that door? I said, well, I've lost the key. <laughs> so it's the only way I can get in. So he said, what happens if you lose the door? I said, I'll climb in through the window. <laughs> and that was the first gag I ever did in Panto. Oh, brilliant. I take it that mum and dad were really supportive. Um, well, I, I never had a dad. I was an immaculate conception. But I did have a lovely mum, bless her. And um, I think uh, my, da my dad sort of disappeared uh, before the war. Um, but nobody's quite sure what happened to my dad. It, 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 it's one of those enigma tales around the family. We weren't quite sure. But uh, anyway... So I never really knew a real father. So my real, the, the, the chap that I recognised as my dad was my granddad, Jack Herbert, who was a music hall comic in the 20s, 30s and 40s. So he was the guy who really I associated with and who I wanted to be. He was my idol because he was a review comic. And that's, you know, that's what I grew up to wanting to be. And did you go and ever see him perform? Oh, yes, all the time, when he was close by. There were a lot of theatres around in, in the 40s um, and early 50s. So I was born in 37, so, you know, the, in the 40s I was uh, old enough, because in those days kids could travel on buses on their own and things. There wasn't any problems in those days. Mm. And I used to go over to the Ardwick Hippodrome, lived in Salford, or the Salford Hippodrome, which was round the corner, or the Palace at Bolton. And then there was another theatre in Salford, um, 
can't quite remember the name of it. It'll come to me anyway. But it was down the bottom of Cross Lane. And I saw wonderful old comics working uh, um, like Frank Randall, who used to come on and belch to the He used to do panto, and he'd come on and belch to the audience because he'd, he'd make sure he'd had a Guinness before he went on. And that's what he used to walk up to the microphone and belch into the microphone. <laughs> Hey, we have had a good one, that were a good one, that were. That's <laughs> true. Great characters, Frank Randall, amazing. And he was around at the time because he used to, obviously, a radio comic as well because they, they were all radio mm. stars, Dave Morris and people of that ilk. And Al Reed, of course, was in the, you know, early 50s. Um, and they were all radio comics. So people used to go to the theatre to see what they looked like because on the radio they obviously sounded different. I mean, Peter Brough and Archie Andrews, they were radio voices. So people would go and see them in variety. And they were the stars of the day, of course. You know, Ted Ray um, and all those wonderful old Tommy Trinder. And because when I joined the Water Rats in 1970, they were all in the Water Rats, all these wonderful old comics who were now at the end of their career, obviously. But um, it was, it was marvellous because the people I'd grown up with in radio listened to on the on the wireless as they were all in the water rights where most of them were still alive we georgie wood and they were all on what was called the top table the top table um the room was set out like a horseshoe with a top table and two sides and the water rats sit around the sides and the, the middle of the top table is the king rat and the past king rats on the top table and then facing them is the prince rat right and um that that's the sort of order of merit and when Lowell and hardy joined the Water Rats in 1946 when they first came over for their for their first big variety tour and were enormously successful. They were immediately inducted into the Grand Order Water Rats and they gave the rats quite a lot of the memorabilia that the rats have on their King Rats table. You know, there's a, there's a sort of a gold egg on a chain. So if you do a bad gag, a bad joke in Lodge, <laughs> Rats Lodge, you have to wear this egg and you pay the fine. And then if you do a great joke, you get a jester's medal, which you hang around your neck. It's called the jester's medal. And everybody else pays the fine because that's how they raise the money for the order. That's the way they used to raise most of the money um, to give to deserving causes, not less being performers who have fallen on hard times from, from which it, 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 was, uh, it was set up, the water rats. And the reason it's called water rats, for those who don't know, is because the word rats reversed is star. So that means you're supposed to elevate your being to, to present yourself as a star of the firmament rather than being, you know, and, and they reverse it, so the, to be the lowest of the low. Did you ever wear the egg? Um, I don't think I ever did. Um, I didn't really do that many quips. You couldn't get them in because there were so many <laughs> wonderful comics there. Amazing comics. Really wonderful. But Bob and Alf Pearson were a marvellous, marvellous singing comedy double act. Very, very funny. And Bob Pearson was red hot. And in, in Lodge, you wear uh, a red collar. And if you've been in 10 years, you wear a blue collar. And somebody had been away for a few years and they came back into Lodge and they said he needs a blue collar, he's got to take off the red collar. And Bob Pearson said he can't go from a red to a blue without potting a yellow. <laughs> 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 wonderful quip, you know. Wonderful, wonderful. So going back then to your time in pantomime then, did you always know that comedy was going to be for you as a career? I never wanted to do anything else, ever. That was it. I wanted to be a comic. I just didn't know how to do it. I mean, I knew how to tell jokes, and I was a cheeky little thing, I think, when I was a kid, because at the age of 10, I went back to London for the first time after the war in 1947, and my uh, grandmother, who lived in Camden Town, she had, uh, she had a sister. No, I'm sorry, she had a brother, and he had... And his wife, <laughs> let's get it right, my, my grandmother's brother had a sister who had a pub in Walthamstow called the Crooked Billet. And I was taken there and I was put on a chair in the billiard room and told to tell jokes, which I did. 
And years later, it became the subject of a small film, or the first film for Peter Chelson, who made Funny Bones. And he'd heard this story backstage uh, in a pantomime season some years later. And when he became a film director, he said, I want to film that story of this little boy who stood in the corner and was told to tell jokes. Obviously, I couldn't do it. I played his father. Um, and his his grandfather... No, I played his grandfather, that's right. His father was played by Ken Goodwin in the film. The film's called Treacle. If ever you can get it on YouTube, do have a look. It's only 11 minutes. It was made for Channel 4. Treacle, it's called. Good film. What was it like then, performing for the pub? Was it nerve Oh, it was marvellous. I mean, I, I'd had no nerves at 10. The kids don't have any nerves at 10. I was just... I did my granddad's act, didn't I? <laughs> All these old jokes, you know, about having babies and getting married. I don't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> but they got laughs and that, they sent the hat round. And I mean, I got... I rem- in, the, in those days, I mean, I got about £12 in 1947. And I got... One of them was a white fiver... And I had this white fibre for years after I kept it. You know, it was like, if we then break into it, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of money. You yeah. know, when, when the, the, the wage was about, you know, pound fifty. you know, the weekly living wage. It was, it was crazy just after the war to get that amount of money. It was, I was rich. And you would have yeah. only been little then as yeah, well. I was 10, so yeah. 10 and yeah. just... Do you remember what you bought with it? Oh, I don't know. I think it just was used up over the years. I can't, you know, I can't remember. I remember we used to have a skip at home, an old an old basket skip, which all old theatricals had, and had the money was stuffed down the side of it <laughs> in an old soccer thing. Something like that. Can't be declared then. No, um, <laughs> non-declared earnings. <laughs> Ten, <laughs> brilliant. So from that. Where did you go to? Well, uh, I progressed in amateur dramatics and amateur variety. I did these Sunday school pantos, which I, I had a penchant for, and I just and I went to see all the shows that I possibly could, all the pantos in the area, usually in the gods, mainly standing at the back. So I didn't really get the chance to sit up the front and watch it, and that's why I always try and sit up the front now and watch it. But, um, so that really was sort of my start. And then the problem was that in the early 50s, all the theatres were closing, so there was literally nowhere for me to work. And I always thought of myself as a theatre comic, a theatre performer, but it was how to get started. So when I went into national service in 1956... In 1957, having gone to the Empire, Newcastle, I was stationed in Newcastle at Fenham Barracks. Uh, I used to go to the Empire every week to see the show. Usually there was a star, you know, they brought all the American stars over. And um, anyway, one of the weeks was the Billy Cotton Band Show. And the comic on the bill was Des O'Connor. So I waited outside the stage door and he came out. He was, a, you know, in 1957, he was... Um, you know, a young modern comic, and I, I, he's what I wanted to be. And I said, how do you get into show business? He said, well, he said, what I did, he said, I went to Butlins and became a red coat. So I thought, well, that's good advice. I said, well, how do you get in? He said, well, you've got to bluff your way in. And then literally, he said, you know, you're supposed to be able to do sports and all that thing, but you just tell him you can do it and then learn on the job. I thought, oh, that's good advice. <laughs> so as soon as I came out in 1958, I wrote a letter to Butlins and they gave me an audition interview at the at the Queen's Hotel in Manchester, which is no longer standing. And in the meantime, I came out of the army in January 6, uh, 50, 1958, wrote the letter for a job, I had a recommendation from the, from my major in the army, which I've still got somewhere. I've still got this actual letter. Um, and it said, he is very good at organising entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I was interviewed at the, at the Queen's Hotel Manchester, and they had a system where there were five holiday camps, Butlin holiday camps, and the entertainment managers used to go around, the five entertainment managers, and go around the country and do these interviews. And as they lost interest in you, they would close the folder. I didn't know this at the time. 
So, and if there was anybody left with a folder open, they were obviously the last person and they wanted to employ you on their camp. And the person with the folder open was a man called Frank Mansell, who became my mentor. He was marvellous, my wonderful man. But he could see something in me. And I did a, I used to do a little bit of magic in those days, sleight of hand magic, which I did for them at the, this interview. And he liked what I did and he employed me at Skegness. And I did six years at Butlins, which was the, really the greatest apprenticeship you could ever have in show business because in those days that was the you know that was the place to be for entertainment because you'd get 2,000 punters a night in the theatres just to get the chance to stand up and do something and of course as a red coat you were one of them really they wanted to mm. you know they wanted to be entertained by you and it was just marvellous experience I mean when I went to to Skegness the first year um, there, there were lots of very good entertainment red coats. One of them was Dave Allen, who was the comic in the red coat show. Only he wasn't anything like he finished up being uh, on television. He, he he worked like Jerry Lewis, very frantic, frenetic. I mean, he changed his style. He went over to Australia and calmed down and changed his style. And then he was a big star in Australia. Then he came back to Britain. And he got off to Granny, but we were we were mates, you know, you know, all his life, and I always contacted him if I went to London, and uh, we would get together and have a drink. It was it was, uh, but we literally started together, you know. That was Dave, dear Dave Allen, bless him. Have you always been a people person then? Probably, yeah, probably. I quite like um, entertaining. I like being amongst people of a like mind you know I like show business people I think you know we all have our own friends and, and what have you but I think I find that people with with a like mind you know showbiz people I can sort of get along with better um, you know because as I say the people are like mind. but I think we're all like that in whatever line of work we do you know we all we all like the people you know our family and our friends you know they they can be um they can be uh, very uplifting, you know, for one. And I I think over the years when you work with so many people in a show, it's a funny your business, show business, because you might do a show with 20 or 30 people in it and you do it for quite a while and then at the end of it you all go your separate ways and then you see them again in 10 years' time and it's like, you know, there was no time there. You, you, you become as you were then. You just carry on with that friendship because it's a very peripatetic business. And if you don't know what peripatetic means, I had to ask also. It, me it means travelling. <laughs> <laughs> you must have knocked up some miles over the years as well. Oh, just a bit, just a bit. God, hours and miles you used to drive in those days, getting to gigs and back again. Didn't think anything of it. I mean, I'd do two shows in Scarborough and, and drive back to Blackpool, you know. It was a nice drive along the A59, and I used to, uh, I used to do that after the show. Maybe stop in in uh, Moulton for fish and chips on the way home, if they were open. But they were never open on a Sunday, which used to annoy me. I used to stop, and uh, fish and chip shops closed. It was never anywhere open on a Sunday night, was it, in those days? Not back then, no. No, no. Do you think comedy's changed much over the years? Yes, it's changed a lot. But it does change over the years. You know, from if you think about the turn of the century and the type of comedy that was acceptable in those days, slapstick comedy, because there were no microphones. So comedians had to be visual and comedic, you know, from a visual point of view. And that's why we, the British, had this wonderful tradition of pantomime because it, it required physical comedy. And the great pantomime comics really formed into an act called Casey's Court. And uh, they were a, a, a combination of comics and funny men and physical comics who formed this act, knockabout comedy. And they went to America and became a huge hit in the States because at the start of the film industry, that's all they could use because they were all silent films. So it all had to be physical comedy. If you think about all the comics that started, they were all physical comics. They had to be. 
and they all could do eccentric dance, they could all could do funny movements. If you think about people like Stan and Ollie, they were very, very physically funny looking as well as being, you know, comedic as well. And Charlie Chaplin, of course, was the greatest exponent of that, you know. And he cottoned on to it. He stayed there, never came back. But Stan Laurel came back because his, his roots were in Britain. But um, so so then it, then it moved on. And the next change in comedy really came after the First World War because when they came back from the war, soldiers... They wanted something perhaps a little more sophisticated, having lived on the continent for four years. And they came back, so they demanded a little more. So sound was getting a little bit better in the theatres, and they and the cinema was coming into into um, into being. So they used to do things like cine variety, whether they're variety acts as well as a film. That was very big in the States. That was the thing in America, this cine variety, or they used to call it cine vaudeville, because variety was called vaudeville in the States. And it was very short-lived in the States because the cinema, the the theatres were owned by big cinema magnets and they would make the films and tour them around America and they were all made in America, of course, the films were. There were a few made over here. So, and as I said, the big circuits were all cinema circuits so they they favored the cinema as opposed to the as opposed to variety which we did of course over here so then oswald stoll and um people like that who built theaters over here and had music halls put started to put more sophisticated variety shows in we included ballet and tap and comedians and physical comedians and jugglers and real variety and of course, that was superseded by the stars of the day. And a lot of the stars of the day in the radio area were comedians, but they were all radio comics. They were all raconteurs. There were very few physical comics. So the physical comics stood out. So in the 40s and 50s and 60s, particularly after the Second World War, when the physical comics all came back out of the army, there were people like Peter Sellers and Tommy Cooper and Ted Ray and all those people who'd come out from the war. And some of them were physical, but a lot of them were just talking raconteurs. And they were, you know, as I say, radio comics. And they needed to have a microphone. They couldn't be heard otherwise. Um, but there were some marvellous physical comics around, even though the people like Nat Jackley and, and Billy Dainty and all those. And I worked with them all in panto. They were great panto artists, you know, because they were, you know, it's physical comedy. And that's what, what pantomime demands. But... So the comedy changed again from radio, into radio comedy. And then as, as, as variety died in the 50s and television took over, a different style of comedy came into being. Situation comedy and that type of entertainment because it could be a story that they could continue for half an hour. So, so they didn't actually have to have, you know, what became known as stand-up comics. The, the, the original title for us w- was front cloth comics because they would they would have a cloth behind the comic while they changed the scene. So the comic would come on for 10 minutes while they changed the scene behind, then they would have a bigger scene with scenery and costumes and ladies maybe with no clothes on sometimes. Yeah. That's me. Which is, <laughs> which is what was demanded of the, you know, the servicemen that came back. Uh, and... Then, then this. I always thought it was a very tatty form of variety, as most people did, because they would have nudes, but they wouldn't be allowed to move. They would just be nude women, static on the stage, and they would have comics around them. I mean, at the windmill, they would have, you know, two or three comics, and just to fill in while they got the next nude scene ready. <laughs> but um, and a lot of comics came up through the windmill for that reason, because they could do their act six times in a day which is a great learning experience. The problem with today is that comics don't get the chance to work enough. See, even in my day, and and I was at the end of it all, when I did summer seasons, you'd you'd do twice nightly. So at least you get the chance to do your act 12 times a week. Well, these days, you look if you can do it once a week. So where are you going to learn? It's very difficult. It's very, very hard. Very, very hard. And the work is now so diversified. I mean, if you became... Or become famous today. There's 
nowhere to go. You know, there's, there's these holiday camp circuits. And unless you're very big, you know, like Mike, Michael McIntyre or Jack White, or you can actually work stadiums. There's only, you know, like a handful of people like that um, that really that really can, can get away with that big stadium feel. That, um, but as I say, and it's moved into that era now. So it has, you see the way it's changed over the years. For you personally, then, what did you prefer to perform? Did you prefer smaller, intimate gigs, or do you prefer sort of the large butlins type rooms with the two thousand people? Oh yeah, the big, bigger rooms, bigger rooms. You see, you see, <clears throat> I think that the bigger rooms are easier to play, particularly if they're full, right? Because there's more people to create an atmosphere. Particularly if you think in terms of these stadiums now. If you've got, say, when you've got a thousand people, right, and you're only going to get 20% of them say 20% of a thousand people is a lot of people laughing at once. If you've got 20,000 and only a third of them are really laughing at you, it's still huge. And laughter, of course, is infectious. You know, it's also very subjective what one person thinks is funny, another person won't, etc. But generally speaking, the bigger the venue, the more people in there, the easier it is. Because, hey, to get. To get any sort of kind of timing, you have to get laughter, and if you haven't got any timing, you ain't. Got, if you haven't got any laughter, you ain't got any timing. <laughs> when do you think then you sort of perfected your act? When you could say, "Yes, I've got it." Um, it took a, it took a while. I mean, when I when I left Butlins, I had a sort of an act, uh, and then I left in nineteen sixty three, and I was working the clubs. And I was trying to develop something that I thought nobody else would be doing. And I didn't realise I was doing it at the time. Because when I found the hat character, Parrotface, it was purely by chance. And I'd, I've often thought back on it and th thought to myself, I didn't realise this. If I'd have thought about it too seriously, it probably wouldn't have happened. It was because it happened by chance and by luck. I was working a club in Manchester. It must have been late. 63 and it was a huge cabaret club I mean it held 1500 people it was it was an old cinema been made into this club it's called the Northern Sporting Club huge absolutely huge that gambling uh, on uh, in another room and then uh, the, the the law was in those days the gambling law was that if you wanted if you wanted gambling in your club you had to, it had to be in inverted commas, respectable. In other words, it had to be in a proper nightclub atmosphere. In other words, you had to have a band with a minimum amount of musicians and you had to have cabaret. You actually had to have cabaret but and then and food so that they would eat and drink and be entertained apart from the gambling. And if they happened to go into the gambling, fine. But the gambling had to be in another room. It was never in the same room as the cabaret. Couldn't be. That was the law. So all these big clubs opened with big gambling casinos, literally on the premises, but through another door. And they could afford, or they had to have, names, stars, whatever, and four or five acts on the bill to sustain it in these big places. So I was in that era doing my act. And so I was able to develop this his character, which uh, the Northern Sporting Club, it would be full at the weekend, but then during the week it would fade away sort of thing. You'd get half a dozen tables. and But they had to keep it going because they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, they weren't allowed, to, they had to put the cabaret on for seven nights a week. You couldn't say, oh, I'm only going to put it on Friday and Saturday. You had to, it had to be respectable. It had to be a proper business. I'm not saying that they were all run by you know, legitimate people, but yeah. they, it had to have that appearance. In the northeast, there was a Bailey circuit, um, which you may or may not remember. But they had some beautiful little nightclubs around. They had a couple in Newcastle and all around the northeast. They were lovely clubs to work, beautiful. Lovely little cabaret rooms and the gambling on the side. And they were just divine to work. You know, the total opposite to the working men's clubs they were. Uh, so and that was all happening in the in the uh, early sixties and seventies. So there were places to work. Anyway, I was working in this club in Manchester, and I'd sort of 
got into an ad lib situation with the audience and a woman shouted out, go on, tell us a joke about a budgie. So I told this joke about a budgie and made it into a characterful thing with a guy with a hat. And it sort of worked a bit better because instead of just the tag of the joke getting a laugh, it got laughs all the way through, continually. The character was getting laughs. And I didn't realise at the time, but about two or three months later, a pal of mine came with me in a car to a club having a stag show, and I didn't, I didn't work stag at all. I worked them, but I just did a clean act, and I did my act. And coming back in the car, he said, have you ever looked at that character you do with a hat on? I said, no, I've never looked at him. He said, you really want to have a look at him in the mirror? He said, he, he is so different to you with the hat on. It, it, the, the change is unbelievable. So I looked at it, and the first thing I thought of when I looked at the head was that it was um, a television head, because television is talking heads. That's all television is, mm. actually talking head. Not all it is, but basically it's talking heads. And I thought this would be great for television. And I, then I consciously started to, to work on the character. So when it came along, when the opportunity came along for me to do it on television... I tried to do it on radio, would you believe? And I was stopped. Um, the producer, the radio producer said to me, uh, you can't do that character act. He said, because he's got a lisp and it's an affliction and we'd get complaints. And when I started to do it and did it on television, it was never mentioned again. The fact that he had a lisp, it was just a character with a, spoke with a funny voice. And uh, I, did, I did a series with this same radio producer. And I said, do you think I should do the lisp? He said, I think we should give it a try. <laughs> he, didn't, uh, he didn't mention it again. The reaction then from the audience is... Uh, yes. Um, uh, you mean after this? After, after that performance after, on TV. Yes, well, it was unbelievable. I... There's a little story involved how I got into doing the first TV show, which was Opportunity Knox. I'd been in Dunoon. The year after I'd finished at Butlins, I finished in 63, 64, I was headhunted <laughs> via Butlins and my mentor, Frank Mansell, to go and do a little summer show in Dunoon in Scotland. The guy wanted a red coat type performer to work in an open-air venue in Dunoon. Well, when I got there, it literally was an open-air venue in Dunoon, right on the shore where the boats came in. And it was a little open-air theatre with a wall, a three-foot wall around it. And chairs laid, like all these deck chair things laid out. Well, they weren't deck chairs, it was just ordinary plastic seating. Um, and I was supposed to do an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, and it was just... The show was called Fun with Freddy, and believe me, it wasn't. <laughs> it was me and a fella called Tom who sat in a flat cap playing the piano. Obviously playing for me, or playing for what I was supposed to do. The trouble was, it rained all the time, so nobody came in. And when they did come in, all the seats were wet, and it was terrible. And if I got, you know, three drunks and a dead dog, I was lucky. <laughs> and I stuck it for two weeks... It was, I was supposed to do eight weeks. It was terrible. I thought I'd stayed eight weeks, but I recently looked back in the diary and I only actually stuck it two weeks because <laughs> I had to come back to Manchester to do a, a radio show. Uh, I think it was an old-time musical on radio from Chester. And when I came out to do it, I really decided I couldn't do go back because it was, A, it was a waste of time. After time, I didn't perform and anyway. So I was literally out of work. And had an agent in Liverpool. And he said, well, I'll see if, see if anything comes in. So I started to get bits of one-nighters in, because I was booked out for ten, for eight weeks, you see. Anyway, he rang me the second week, beginning of the second week, and he said, there's a new programme started called Opportunity Knox. And I'd thought it was an amateur show, because in Ireland it was an amateur show, and Huey Green did it in Ireland on radio. And it was... Quite amateur, actually. Anyway, he started up over here, and I'd seen, I think it had been on two weeks on the run, and I'd watched it, and it was a little bit amateur in as much as I thought, well, really, I'm working clubs and theatres, and I really, I don't really think I'm amateur. I'm getting paid for it. These mm. people, 
and it didn't seem to me like a profession. Anyway, I went down to see the producer on the Wednesday, and he said um, he was of the business. He was Benson Dulé's son. Benson Dulé used to do a big magic show, a whole evening of magic, and his son Peter Dulé became a television producer. Eventually, went on the screen and did Candid Camera some years later. Anyway, so he was an ex-performer, and he said, look, Freddie, I don't want to interview you or watch you cold. He said, can I come and see your work? Well, I'd, I'd fixed or been fixed for this little club in Oldham called the Candlelight Club on the Friday night. So I went down to Oldham, and I'd said to uh, Peter Dulock, that's where I'm going to be on Friday if you'd like to come. He said, well, OK, I'll come after rehearsals. Because in those days, when it first started, they used to record it on a Saturday afternoon, and it went out Saturday evening. So they couldn't have any editing time. It was Well, they very rarely edited the, the, in those days anyway. Um, so they'd been rehearsing during the week and doing band calls and things, and he came to me a Friday night. I did my little spot, did the thing with a hat. When I came off, he was in the dressing room, and he said, um, OK, you know that thing you do with a hat? I said, yeah, he said, it's about four minutes. I've just timed it. He said, I think I'd like to put you on tomorrow night. And I went, what? He said, yes. I said, that quick? He said, that's quick. So I said, what about the show, though? You, surely you've got somebody you've been rehearsing. He said, yes, that is true. He said, and I've been thinking about it, and I'm going to take somebody out and put you in. I thought, that's ruthless, isn't it? <laughs> I thought, why couldn't he wait till the next week? You know, he's, anyway. He said, can he be at the studio at nine in the morning? I was so excited. I was also... I'd been fixed at the Liverpool Cabaret Club for a midnight show on, um, for the week. So I, I went to Liverpool, did the midnight show, went home to Blackpool, said to my wife, look, I've got to be at the studio at nine in the morning, so I'll just sleep on a settee, get my bits of music together. I mean, I didn't sleep, I was too excited. <laughs> got to Didsbury. I mean, I was only young, I could do it in those days. Got to Didsbury, nine in the morning, and this poor comic who they'd taken out of the show, apparently he complained because they'd said he was ill. And it was a few years later when they actually did put him on. He'd, he'd complained, sent solicitors letters and stuff, and said, well, he'd actually been booked to do it, and he had, of course. I don't know what happened, whether they didn't like him or what. But anyway, they took him out, put me in, and, you know, when you think, in those days, 1964, 22 million people watched. 1st of August. It was just tremendous. And I never looked back from that day for about 20 years. It, I never stopped working, ever, or worried about work for 20 years after then. It just escalated. It was just incredible. All the things that I always wanted to do came true, came to life. The pantomimes, the starring in pantos, the writing, the producing, all that, it all came purely from that one appearance. I mean, I did lots of TV after it, but it was just that one appearance. It was just incredible. And you can't comprehend 22 million people watching you at once. It's just absolutely frightening. Um, if you if you were to think about it, you, you don't think about it. You know, it's just just incredible. And that's what started it all off. And I'd just never look back. But funnily enough, the first job I did after that, because I didn't have much work in the book, remember, real mm. term. Somebody called up and said, um, he's, we like his his comedy and we'd like to put him on the American bases in Paris or around Paris. So, very good money. I go over to Paris. I go there, they do the opening night. I drove, well, I didn't drive. I was driven to this American army base four hours out of Paris. I get there and I died. My God, I died. I'm not a titter, all these American servicemen reading papers in their in their naffy, you know. And uh, the pianist who was driving us, the, the show in this one car, there was another couple of acts on as well. The pianist who was driving because got so drunk that I had to drive home because <laughs> I was the only one who had a European passport <laughs> or a passport that was acceptable. In the other two had American passports and they couldn't anywhere of driving last. So I drove on the wrong side of the road, on the right, <laughs> as you do in France, four hours back. I mean, I don't know how I made it, but I did. And they never used me again. I stayed two weeks in this hotel in Paris. They wouldn't put me out again because I died so. 
badly. I still got paid. I, did, I stayed for two weeks. I think I went out on one more job. I just compared on this job, and they mm. said, we're obviously not suitable for the American uh, serviceman. I mean, I mean, they had acts. They didn't have any comics on. They had acts like um, bow and arrow. A, a fellow shot his bow and arrow and with a girl with an apple mm. on her head. You know, very backwards and with a blindfold on. That special acts, you know. A big acts from America. But um, and very good acts, of course. But they didn't have any comics. I noticed that, and I thought he's seen me and gone. <laughs> He'll probably do well, and of course I didn't. <laughs> they didn't understand me at all. <laughs> have you ever tried to break America? Um, uh, y- 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 two answers to that question. First, I worked in America for five years, but I didn't do the character. I worked on the cruise ships, and because they didn't know me out there, I was able to try other stuff which was good uh, and then uh, I did it now and again if, if there was any English passengers on which was very rarely I would sometimes do it because I was totally unknown in the state then I became a cruise director which I enjoyed uh, and I cruised for four years so I did work a lot to American audiences but funnily enough uh, Dean Martin did a TV show in the States, and he had a summer replacement show, which is called The Martin Show, and he introduced it. But the acts were not there. He, they came and recorded them in London, and they recorded every comic working in Britain on a theatre in the West End, brought an audience in, recorded us all, and then put them out on The Dean Martin Show in the States. Uh, and, and that was the only time I actually worked on television in the States. You know, but yeah. So uh, other than Funny Bones, the film, of course, which came out in the states. But no, I never really tried to get on television in the states. I didn't, and just it just never came up. You know, you're always quite happy then, just being a British comedian. Oh yes, yes. I mean, I worked in Australia and English speaking countries. You know, but um, I did cabaret in, in in hotels in South Africa and things. You know, where there was. You know, an English-speaking audience. But basically, I was English-speaking, yeah. yeah. Then the pantomimes after a opportunity. Pantomime. Enough. We ought to get to pantos. We should, really. As this is the panto podcast. <laughs> we keep getting sidetracked. You keep asking me interesting questions. Well, it's, people want to know about yes. your history and everything. It's, you know. um, I got into panto immediately uh, after, after uh, Opportunity Knocks, really, because I did... I did a showcase for my agent in Liverpool. And at the showcase was the Bachelor's manager. And he was putting the Bachelor's out uh, for the next two or three years. They'd become big stars. And he had them booked for about three years. And he put me on the bill with them, which was great for me. Great. There was first a tour. It started in 65. A 12-week tour. Summer season in Yarmouth. Panto in Bristol, Ooh, summer season in Blackpool, and that after that, I sort of broke away from them and did a panto in Coventry. Uh, and that, that was really the start of me getting becoming top of the bill in panto, because after the panto in Coventry, the, the people who ran the Coventry panto was Pauline Grant, and she... They put the pantos into Bradford, Alhambra, which was the big panto date. And I went into the Pied Piper in Bradford with Mark Winter. And that was my first top of the bill thing. That was 67. So it was very soon after Opnox. And it was really what I wanted to do. It was fabulous. So then I I did the Pied Piper for two years, Bradford and Nottingham. And in those days, we would do 13 weeks You'd go into Easter. Oh, it was, I mean, you would you would start two or three days before Christmas Eve, and um, and run until Easter. It was incredible, absolutely incredible, tremendous. I remember making pancakes on the stage at the Alhambra <laughs> for the press, a publicity shot, doing pancakes, Pancake Tuesday, which was February, and then it went on to almost Easter. It it was just. Just a, a, a long, a lot of panthers had long runs. I mean, I don't remember ever doing less than 10 weeks. You know, 10 weeks was sort of minimum. That would be the booking, 10 weeks. That's unheard of now. I know, 
I know it's just um, just gone, and, and and I never I never looked back then because every Christmas I would do I did all the the major theatres in Britain. Um, I went on and did Bristol Hippodrome, which is lovely. With um, I mean, it, it used to go in every year, so it was nothing special. But Cary Grant was in one particular year because he used to go and visit his mother, who was in a in a home in in uh, Bristol. Uh, and I remember the company manager coming around and saying, he doesn't want you to mention him, but he's watching the panto, and it's Cary Grant, you see. So I said, OK. He said, but he said he's asked, could he come round and meet you after the show? I said, I'm absolutely thrilled. <laughs> so, and he did. So I walk on the stage, I promise, it was an old age pensioner's matinee, Thursday matinee at the Hippodrome, Bristol. And he was head and shoulders above everybody else in the audience, <laughs> on the fifth row in the middle. Talk about talk about being spotted. He's got his little daughter with him, American daughter, and with Diane Cannon, and her nanny, who was who was there also, and and they were obviously not part of the audience. And when I asked for six kids up on the stage at the end of the show. Because there were no other kids in the audience, well, there was a half a dozen, you know, grannies had brought the kids. She came up with his kids. So I was, I used to do a thing interviewing the children in Panto, and I said to the first kid, where are you from? And he said, oh, Bristol, I'm from Bristol. I said, where are you from? I'm from Western Soup, Mayor. So I got to the end, and I said to the little girl, she was about six, I said, where are you from? She said, Louisiana. (laughs) Gorgeous child. And in those days, I used to give... Each little kid, apart from chockies and sweeties and bits and bobs, a little hat, one of my hats, you see, and send them off, and that was it. Well, many years later, and I go back many years later, let's say 20 years later, I'm at the Water Rats Ball, and Cary Grant had been invited, and I hadn't seen him since. And he was on a table in the middle of the room, why they put him there, I don't know, because he had a queue a mile long waiting for autographs. And the, the meal came, and I went over, and I said, I stood behind him, and I said, look, folks, let him eat his meal. I'm sure you'll sign all your bits of paper and autograph books as soon as he finished. And they dispersed. He didn't even look up from the table, and he said, Freddie, my daughter still has the hat. Wow. You remember my voice? Isn't that incredible? Yes, amazing, absolutely amazing. Anyway, he came backstage on the night. He was just... Wonderful. Came in the dressing room, and because he, he, he started his life as a clown, you know, he was a clown, so he knew about all the slapstick, he knew about all that. But he was a, just, a, and he was a beautiful looking man, even even when he was older, you know, with that lovely grey hair, uh, and he was an absolute sweetheart, absolute darling. We chatted in the dressing room for about an hour, and um, he said, "Oh, I like that bit of business you did when you did that thing," and he mentioned things that I'd done in the panto. He was very, very observant and 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 very, very kind, you know, and helpful and helpful. He was just just a joy to meet, you know, this this great big wonderful film star. And we had a picture taken. There was a press were outside, and the, and the press guy came in and I have an amazing picture with, of him with the hat on. Yeah, it's a wonderful picture. Yeah, I'll show you before you go. It's a marvelous picture. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I always tell you about about Panto over the years because I developed a bit of a thing for Panto and a certain way of doing it. I was taught by a, a guy called uh, Edwin Espinosa, who was from the, the uh, Downs um, family, the Espinosa family, who were a very well-known dance family in the 30s and 40s. And he was getting on, but he directed his panto in Bristol. And he gave me lots of bits of business to do in the show. And really very, very fabulous panto director. Excellent he was. And gave me lots of ideas and things we could do. And we tried things out. And he was just just absolutely great to work with. And he gave me ideas of how to really put a panto on. And I watched... I watched him direct and saw that how he did stuff. So when I got the chance to direct, having done several then myself, I jumped at the chance and I just, I loved directing as well. And what I found in directing was that if you're doing the job right, I think, this is just a personal thing, if you're doing the job right, you are helping the performers to do 
better than they think they can do. In other words, they've all got so much in them, you know, as a performer, that sometimes it's difficult to say to the director, you know, really what I, I want to... That sometimes they're frightened to say it, or, or not frightened to say it, but think they're going to be knocked back. Because quite a lot of directors say, no, I want to do it exactly as the script says. I don't want to deviate. Because it, but I don't... I've never done that. I've always said, what's the best you can get out of this gag? This is the way we want to, want to do it. But do you think if we did this... And, of course, when I, in my directing career, which which became another thing, I had marvellous people in Panto, like Bernie Winters and Charlie Drake, who was really... You could really watch this man learn and learn because he was terribly inventive. He would say to him, Charlie, what, what do you want to do here? He said, well... Lamar boy, he said, what I want you to do, he said, he's, uh, build me a wardrobe that collapses. I said, how do you mean? He said, well, you know, I want it to come away from the wall so I can hang on it. He was just delightful. And we made the props for him, and of course, and he made them work. He was just fabulous. And, you know, you learn from all these people, and you take it all in. I mean, he did some wonderful, wonderful pantagogues. One of the greatest gags he taught me was a, a disappearing rabbit gag where he in in the bakery scene he'd bring this furry rabbit on and put it down in the baking tin and it was on an elastic and it <laughs> used to whiz off you see and they'd bring it back on and, do you know the gag have you seen it I've seen it yeah but please tell the listeners then yeah well, it's a wonderful yeah. and the gag whizzes off in the elastic and then he brings it back eventually he brings the rabbit on and there's no elastic on it so he puts it down it doesn't go anywhere and they make a crust and put it on the pie and put the pie in the oven. And then the oven starts to smoke and they take it out of the oven and brings it to the table in front of the stage, takes the crust off. And, of course, there's a real rabbit inside. And it, the lights, of course, a rabbit, a real rabbit, and its eyes and ears come up. And it's a wonderful tag to the gag. Just what, Well, that came from Charlie. I know it's been done... You know, before I'd never seen it before, but I just loved the, you know, the way he where he got it together. It was just absolutely superb. But all you know, these people you learn from, and you um, you adapt them and put them in other shows. You know, which is great. So that was that was my start in panto, and really, to, and when I started putting on my own pantos and directing them, I mean, Norman Wisdom also I had in a panto in. Uh, in Oxford, I couldn't direct that one. I had to put somebody else in to direct because I was doing two other pantos, which I'd already committed to. But in any event, he didn't really want me to direct it, Norman. <laughs> he, he got John Redgrave, who was a very, very good uh, director, very good. And Norman, he never deviated anyway. He wanted to do what he did. And he'd done it forever in panto. And I remember seeing him at the Palladium. And it was all the same stuff that he'd done. Before that's what he did, Norman, and you couldn't knock him for it. He was one of the biggest draws, theatre draws ever, you know. And Burley, and I loved the man. He was a, he was a sweeter. When I went to to see him, to ask him to do it in the first place, was in the Isle of Man, and he picked me up. I flew over to the Isle of Man, went to the house, and he did the pantomime for me in the afternoon in his front room, playing the piano, all the tunes, everything because he was a good musician as well. And I sat in the armchair, nodding off, and he'd went through this entire three-hour panto, doing all the characters. <laughs> yeah, he just he just needed to entertain and perform, bless him. And uh, he was a, he became a good friend, yeah. He was like that at the end, though, wasn't he? Yes, still he wanted to perform. Oh, yes. He never, but yes, he finished up at a nursing home doing his act, mm. you know, which, yeah, he was marvellous, marvellous. Poor love, bless him. I remember seeing him on a train once, going down to London. I forget where he... He was sitting very quietly in second class and <laughs> he must have been a multi-millionaire. And I was in first and I said, Norma, why don't you come through and have a cup of tea? Well, I'm not allowed in there. He said, I can't afford to go in first class. I said, don't be stupid. Come on. Incredible. <laughs> going back then to pantomime, Yeah. what do you like to see in a pantomime when you were directing? What, did, what sort of business did you like to have involved with it? Uh, well, it's not necessarily Panto, but particularly in Panto. I think because the story is so well known, I think you have to find surprises along the way. I think you have to find 
something within that the context of the story that they don't know. Not necessarily with the story. The story can be told. But within the story, to do something that is actually going to, you know, surprise the audience. Because surprise is the only thing that will ever entertain an audience if they are surprised by something. I mean, how many times have you sat in any type of a show and it's ordinary because you've seen it or heard it all before and at the end you say, yeah, it was all very nice. But if somebody comes on or something happens in the show that you haven't seen before, that's the bit that really entertains you. And I think, remember I had a choreographer working uh, with me once, a girl called Mary Mitchell, she was very good. She said, I don't like to see any show that I come out and think, have I learned anything? And it's it very true. What she meant was, has she been surprised by anything mm. from that show? So I used to look for ways to just, in, in not necessarily deviating from the story, but as part of the story, to do something which is a surprising and entertaining and funny and comedic and, and carries the story along, you know. And um, I found lots of different gags and ways of doing things and lighting effects. That, that, that I mean, nowadays they do 3D stuff and, and you know, all sorts of stuff they do. It's marvellous. And projections and everything. And uh, that's good because that also, you know, is is surprising as well. But I don't... I think pantomime can can have a tendency to become a bit boring as well. If, if, if as I keep saying, they're not done very well. Um... And there's, there now seems to be so many new type pantos along the way that um, I think some of them have lost a, a, a bit of the gloss that they used to have because they can't afford them. If they're only on for two or three weeks and, you know, with four or five days rehearsal, you haven't got the time to actually get the stuff right and do it properly because in the most opening nights are very difficult because you haven't learnt it properly. If it's, you haven't got long enough to rehearse it. You know, it, a rehearsal time means rehearsing the material to get it good. So so it's better. And um, so by the time you open, you find that you're still finding things on the last night, which which is show business in general. But particularly in Panto, when they're very short runs, they don't really have a chance to try stuff out and get it good. That, that, that's my main complaint today. Did you find yourself, when you were performing, going off the book as well? Oh, many times. Oh, many times. I mean, I was very naughty. I mean, I think... <laughs> but I think, you know, if it's something that the audience can <laughs> can associate with, um, sometimes, you know, it, it, it's worth it. I remember, I remember the, the first time I had a, 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 a slight mishap. Well, I had several mishaps, but the first time... Uh, in the Pied Piper there's a lovely scene where he takes the children I played the Pied Piper where he takes the children away uh, because they won't pay him the money he wants and um, he takes the children away and he's taken him to his mountain lair um, and on the way they sing a song together him and the children because he says to them can anybody sing and one kid says Yes, I can sing, and the other one could say, we never, t we, we never, we never found out to sing, Mister Piper, and he teaches them a little song. Was <laughs> one of us in? He said, "There's a little cripple boy," and he said to him, "He said, and and um, where are you taking us, Mister Piper?" And I said, "Well, I'm taking you to a land where birds sing all day, and people are always happy, and you've got plenty to eat, and it's just a wonderful place to be." And one of the other kids said, where's that, Mr. Piper? <laughs> and I said, the Hall of the Mountain King. But I used to take, that was the first half finale. So this particular night, the kid said, where's that, Mr. Piper? I said, Heckman Wyke. <laughs> well, the director came round and he said, do you think it's worth saying Heckman Wyke? I said, did you hear the laughter and applause that came from it? <laughs> so... It was just in the middle of all that that it. I mean, it didn't. It wasn't always Heckman White. Sometimes it was Oswald Twistlehorse, one of those wonderful northern towns. But, but yes. But um, whether that was right or wrong, it did get a big reaction. 
<laughs> but I, I, I wasn't an advocate of, of really deviating from the... I mean, if it was good enough, it should have been at rehearsals. Mm. You know, I remember there's a famous story about Laurence Olivier directing a uh, a play and, and he said at the after the opening night, I'm going to go away and come back and take out the improvements. <laughs> 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 when did you first find then about your singing voice? Um, well, I've always been able to sort of get a, a tune over, do a song, and, that, and it was and it was fine. And then I was working with Des O'Connor, funnily enough, in one of his TV shows, and Ronnie Hilton was on the show, and his manager was there, who was a recording manager, and he said to me, uh, you got, "Can you do anything in that funny voice singing?" I said, "Of course I can." He said, "Have you got any material?" I said, "Well." Not really. Well, I'll try in a minute. Because a guy had stopped me in a club in Burnley and he'd written this song called Santa Face is Bringing Me a Budgie. It's a little bird no bigger than a spoon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I remember it. So I said, well, is this one the Christmas thing? So he said, and I said, but there's another one we could put on the B-side, which is Lionel Bart's Give Us a Kiss for Christmas. So he rang me and I said, but it's late for Christmas. This was like, this time of the year, November. I said, it's a bit late for Christmas. He said, it's never too late if the material's good enough. So he rang me on the Monday and he said, can you come down to the studio on a Wednesday? And he sat with a little trio and played. Um, and I did the two songs. And they put them out for Christmas. They actually got them out. And uh, I don't know if they sold any. I never got any royalties from it. But, <laughs> but um, years later, I did a Christmas album called Give Us a Kiss for Christmas. Uh, with all Christmas songs on. Oh. And, um... Please have. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, you cut that bit out. But, uh, yes, it's good. There's a song on there, 12 Days of Christmas, which I was sitting in the dressing room in Bradford, and I had these two fellas who used to write for me, a guy called Laurie Kingsley. Mike Craig and Laurie Kingsley. And they, he lived... It, one of them lived in Batley. The other one lived nearby. And they'd written a parody to the 12 Days of Christmas. And they came to my dressing room with it about two days before Christmas. And one said, what do you think about this? And I read it and I said, that is fabulous. I'm going to do that in the panto. And it was quite a learn, but I did it, you know. And I'm going to do it on the 5th of December this year at uh, St. James's Palace for Princess Anne, whether she likes it or not. Oh. <laughs> to the tower. <laughs> to the tower. <laughs> Could you give us a little burst now? Yes. Just a little burst. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a budgie in a silver cage. <laughs> On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two milk sprays and a budgie <laughs> in a silver cage. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three apple cores, two milk sprays and a budgie in a silver cage. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me four lettuce leaves, three apple cores, two milk sprays and a budgie in a silver cage. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave... You saw you asked, don't you? <laughs> On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me five pots of seed, four lettuce leaves, three apple cores, two millet sprays, and a bungee in a silver cage. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me twelve swings are swinging, eleven bells are ringing, ten wooden perches, nine silver mirrors, eight little ladders, seven plastic playmates, six sanded bottoms, five pots of seed, four lettuce leaves, three apple cores, two millet sprays, and a bungee in a silver cage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. My own personal performance. That's absolutely... <laughs> And that, I did that in panto, I always did it in panto, um, for, forever. And it was just, um, it was it was perfect, you know, as an opening as an opening routine. But I used to get the audience to join in, five parts of seed, and then I'd get all the dancers and singers and kids to come on and do the last bit. And a budgie in a silver cage. Yes, it went, um, it was good. That was my, my favourite pantomime song, yeah. Have you ever had a budgie? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. The it's, trouble is, um, when you get one for Christmas, they're just, uh, I don't know. They're need, messy, aren't they? Well, you need several, actually, because there's not a lot of meat on them, you know. <laughs> and uh, they're bloody hard to stuff. Maybe. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, as soon as you pluck them, there's hardly anything left. <laughs> 
So you've never had a parrot at all, either? No, I was offered a parrot once. I, I, when I did a, se- a series called Samuel, it's more well the Samuel Tweet, they got this lovely macaw who used to sit on the counter, and he belonged to this farmer, beautiful bird, and then it would make noises, and I would put a voice to it as if it was talking, mm. you know. But um, apparently this bird in real life used to live on the farm, and it would fly with the birds the pigeons and that have you know above, and he'd bark <laughs> like the like the dogs you see because that's what he'd learned to do bark, <laughs> and the pigeons used to be frightened to death. <laughs> he would, There's a dog up here with us. <laughs> you can imagine it, couldn't you? Anyway, I was off at the end of the season. They said the farmer would sell it to you if you wanted to buy it. So I asked my wife and I said, do you want? Should we have a macum? And they're big birds, you know. It's like having a dog. You need to need looking after, mm. and. I, to be quite honest with you, I, I, that seemed to look wrong in a cage. You know, cage birds. Um, I mean, it's bad enough having a budgie in a cage. No wonder they fly away. Mm. You know, they're sick of it, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> stuck in a cage. <laughs> I would, you wouldn't like to be stuck in a cage, would you? What actually started off that kind of relationship with you and birds? Well, because that was the joke. The mm. joke was about the guy going in the pet shop to buy a budgie, and then when he sold it to him, he said it doesn't talk. He said, well, you, you've got to put it in a cage, so he, he buys a cage, puts the bird in the cage. He said, it still doesn't talk. He said, well, it, uh, doesn't it twitter when it's on a swing? He said, no, no, I haven't got a swing. So he sold him the swing. <laughs> then he sells him the mirror and the ladder and all the toys. And after about a month, he goes back and he said, the, the budgie's dead. So this was the original gag. So the fellow in the picture said, well, did it say anything before it died? And he said, oh, yes. Budgie spoke before he died. With his last dying breath, he said, hasn't that fellow sold you any bird seed? <laughs> well, that was the original gag, you see. So I made it uh, the character complaining about the bird. Mm. And that's how the bird thing came about. I became the budgie man. So the name Parrot Face came from the fact that every time he went back in the pet shop, he shouted at the guy, he said, come here, parrot face. I'm sick up to here because this budgie still hasn't spoken. Still hasn't. So that was the way parrot face came. And it was my fault uh, that the word got into my name, which should never have done. It was supposed to be underneath the name. You should say Freddie Davis, parrot face. And then I would have thought that people would say, oh, that's the guy that does that thing. Because unless there's going to be a picture on the poster, they don't really know, they don't read names, people. Anyway, this printer decided to put the name Parrotface in the middle of the name. So I became Freddie Parrotface Davis. That was never the intention. It should have been underneath the name. I never planned that at all. And then people started calling me Freddie Parrotface Davis, which is quite a mouthful. Because when I ask people to introduce me in the stage, I say, don't say Freddie, but just say Mr. Parrotface, Freddie Davis. And that, it's, it's easy to say anyway, you know. But um, anyway, I don't, I don't care now at my age because, <laughs> <laughs> because um, it's all in the past and it all worked and it's all been marvellous. I've had a marvellous career, a really wonderful career. I mean, right through the spectrum of Summers and Pantos. I mean, I suppose Panto, without a shadow of a doubt, is a favourite because it really is family entertainment. You know, the grannies and granddads and the mums and dads and the kids, you all used to come together and it was, and they still do, of course. And it's a way of introducing kids to the theatre. I mean, performers always say that. You know, it's a way of introducing kids to the theatre. I remember when I did the Harry Potter film at the premiere, um, Alan Rickman, he... Uh, he collared me at the function. He said, oh, I'd never met him before. Ah, oh, Mr. Davis, he said. Uh, and we, we obviously shook hands. And, and he said, I have a story to tell you. So he told me, he said, when I first started, he said, I was at the Rex in Wimslow in Pantomime. And I was playing King Rat. And he came very close to me and he said, and I've been playing the same part ever since. <laughs> Oh, and he have been great to sin in Panto as oh. well. But it's true. I mean, he used to just play the villain and he used to play like King Rat. It's absolutely true. Um, but what a lovely thing to say, because he knew I was associated with Panto, you know. How did you get asked to be in Harry um, Potter? They just, they, I think the director, um, 
was uh, uh, Alfonso Cuaron, and he was a fan of the film I did, Funny Bones. Have you seen it, Funny Bones? Yes. You've seen Brilliant it? Brilliant film. Oh, no, I was going to give you a copy if you haven't seen it. <laughs> but uh, um, so I think he was a fan of that, and that it stemmed from that. I mean, a lot of things I've done since then quietly have, have been a, a, as reaction to the film. You know, from I get lots of sort of people who are doing comedy festivals, like you know, around the country. They show it, they show the film, and uh, they, they'll go to my agent and say, you know, any chance that I could go to? Because I'm the only person left from the film. I mean, Oliver Reed died. Um, uh, what's his name? Jerry Lewis died. It was in the states, of course, and and the rest. Uh, wait, um, and and, and um, what's the other guy who was in it over here? Richard Griffiths, he died. Um, Leslie Caron, of course, mm. lives in France. So, so if they want a representative from the film, then that then they, they they'll come on for me, you know. Which is not, and I don't mind going to talk about it. I mean, I, I usually have to sit through it again. I mean, I've seen it. I don't know how many times <laughs> now, and it never gets any better. <laughs> it, it's the same <laughs> film, but uh, but I don't. I, I, and I enjoy. I, I enjoyed. The, the 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 idea of making the film it was just because it was a, a, an original concept which came from these backstage stories that I told or were told uh, when I was directing a panto in Ipswich and Peter Chelson who was a young actor aspiring actor who became director heard all these stories and one of them was about my granddad doing a slapstick routine with a newspaper and. Um, he, he he wrote a premise of a for a film about a guy who was slapping another guy with a newspaper, but in an act of vengeance killed him. Uh, and that's what funny ones. The, it was based on that. I mean, there were a lot of other things happening in it as well, but it was actually originally based on that idea, which comes from my granddad's act, which is marvelous. But um, but the title funny bones. I first heard it from Ronnie Corbett, who came to see a summer show I was doing in Yarmouth. He was at the other theatre, and they opened later than us. And he came to see our show one evening, and he came backstage, he came in the dressing room, he said, we're totally different, you know. I said, why? He said, well, he said, you've got funny bones, and I haven't. I'm really a comedy actor. I mean, I, th I thought he was funny, little Ronnie. I always did. But he was he was originally just a comedy actor. And he started out as a feed for Dan LaRue. But anyway, Ronnie was a great friend. And uh, um, so he gave me the, the name Funny Bones. And I thought, that's a nice idea. So when we were discussing the film with Peter Chelson and the other writer, who was um, Peter Flannery, who actually wrote the drama in it, um, they were asking me the different types of comedy, about different types of comedy. And I said, well, there's a funny bones type, you know, physical comedy, and there's a more of a raconteur type, you know, anecdotal type. Uh, and um, he said, oh, that's a good name, Funny Bones. I said, yeah, it is a good name. And that's, the film became Funny Bones. Is that your proudest piece of work? Um... I, I look back on it affectionately. I, I wouldn't say I'm that... You say I'm proud of, proud of everything I've done, really. Uh, I think that... If I could say I'm, a, I'm proud of a piece of work, I, I'd like to think in terms of... Probably the panto I put on, I produced, in Leicester. It was a huge venue, the De Montfort Hall, and I had the, the chance to put on Cinderella. And I put on the stellar cast. I have to say, it, at the time, I think it was the best panto in the country. In fact, it was it was known as the best panto in the country. It it, it just had the, the the best cast. I had the Bill Maynard, who was at the top of his fame. You know, it was before Greengrass and everything. It was when he was so in Frog it everyone, and he was very big on. And he played the Baron. Had Christopher Beanie, who was, you know, really buttons in Upstairs Downstairs. He was, you know, and he played Buttons. Uh, uh, Patrick Moore playing the Prince uh, before Emmerdale. And 
I'm trying to think. Oh, Cinderella was Jessica Martin. The fairy godmother was Peggy Mount. It was just the best cast. And it worked so beautifully. It really, really did work. Oh, Bob Grant was one of the ugly sisters. Just from on the buses, go- yeah. Yeah, from on the buses. It was just a marvellous cast. And because it was such a big theatre, I had a nice orchestra in the pit. One of the best pit bands, I think. 10 or 12 in the pit with percussion and just, you'd have loved it. I love a band of mine. And people were calling me up on a, on a daily basis and saying, we went to see Lester last night. That's the way to do it. And I was that was the one I was really proud of, if you could say a proud of piece of work. From a performing point of view, I suppose Funny Bones, yes. Um, from a performing point of view, I... Um, from from a stand up point of view, probably it was a Blackpool night out from the ABC Blackpool, and the compare was Tony Hancock, and Eric Merriman was writing his links, and he and his link was, I'd just been talking to a parrot, and he was telling me jokes about Freddie Davis, and that was my entrance. <laughs> the only trouble was that it had been done three times before. <laughs> He'd written it for every bloody compare who'd ever introduced me. <laughs> so I said to Tony, you know, that's been done quite a bit. He said, well, I won't do it then. I said, oh, he said, I'll do something else. I said, okay. So he walked on and he said, in a very droll voice, as only Tony Hancock done, ladies and gentlemen, an English comic, Freddie Davis, and walked <laughs> off. It's a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> introduction, yeah. So that was, that was good. But uh, it always amazed me that so many comedians did impersonations and I think they did me more good than anything. I mean, every comic and impressionist money, it was an easy impression to do really. It wasn't, it wasn't difficult to do, but um, that was a great thrill as well. You know, it was just, just marvelous. As I, as I keep saying, I've just, when I look back, I had a marvelous career and in my, in my book, which came out two or three years ago. It was the rewriting of it all and going back on it and thinking, so, you know, it was, you don't plan your life, you can't. Mm. It just, it's what happens to you. You know, you, you, that's what, that's what you become over the years. You become the sum of your parts, I suppose. And you, you, very, very difficult to plan. It's just, you know, any opportunities you get, try and take them. I say to young comics, you know, if an opportunity comes along, don't be difficult. Go with the flow. You never know what, what it could do for you. You know, you really don't. Um, I mean, I love show business. I really do. I was asked recently to do a talk about a, my career, and it ended up by me saying, what have I learned over the years? And I mentioned one or two things that I've learned from other people that I put into practice, that I know work, and they were quite... Um, quite aghast at, at, at uh, what, what I think they, they picked up from it. You know, the trouble with performing is that you forget because you don't work enough, you know, what you're meant to do. You know, because you, you're only maybe working once a week or whatever um, and doing gigs in all different places. That everywhere's different, so you have to adapt immediately. And that's the most difficult thing, I think. Today for performers, it really is difficult because you can't, don't get a chance to hone your your career and your business. And I think that's the most difficult thing for performers today, you know. But it, I, it's lovely to see these spectacular pantos now, you know, like the Palladium and 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 the big theatres like Birmingham and and Bradford still doing, still doing a spectacle in their shows, which is which is wonderful. You've worked with so many of the greats over the years. Mm-hmm. Who have been your favourites? To work alongside, I suppose, Billy Dainty, Dame, Billy, Billy and I worked together three times. We did, uh, we did um, Birmingham, Manchester, and a BBC Panto, which came out on Christmas Day, which is lovely. And we always worked together a lot, Bill and I, because we always did all the comedy scenes together. And, and Bernard Breslau was, was a wonderful pantomime performer. He was a great actor, Bernard. Uh, he was a, he was a lot better than people give him credit for. He really was a proper, you know, Shakespearean actor. I mean, bless him. When he passed away, he was doing Shakespeare in the Park. He was only fifty nine. Very sad. And he was a true mate. Really, really was a good pal. He was in that panto in Bristol playing Abenaza. 
and he was really into it. He was really vicious and evil. People didn't know it was him. He was that. He was that effective. Yeah. Then the following year, we played uh, Birmingham, and then Manchester. Bernie did all of them. It was great, great. Um, I remember in in, uh, in Manchester. I think it was yeah. We were doing Aladdin in Manchester. Anita Harris played Aladdin, and he played. He played. Abenazza. I think he played Abenazza in Manchester. Did he play Abenazza in Manchester? Or did he play the Emperor? Anyway, one of the parts. But he did it virtually in Chinese. Aladdin, yeah. Oh, I don't know what you were talking about. Because you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that was his training, you know, as, a, as an actor. But I um, had some fabulous experiences. I remember I had to stand in for a, for Ken Goodwin once who had been taken ill. And I wasn't doing Panto that year. Or I'd finished earlier, or something, anyway. And he was in Nottingham, and I went to Nottingham. Uh, t- t- what what they would do, because the star of the show wasn't on, they would put somebody in who would just go and do a spot at the end. Anyway, I went out, and I did a bit of a spot at the end of the show. And then uh, Audrey Jeans was in it. She said, please go on tonight and play the part. So I said, why? I said, I'm, I don't know the, the, the pantomime. He was checking the beanstalk. She said, oh, we'll push you through it. <laughs> And Nat Jackley was the dame. She said, the fellow that they understood it hadn't learnt it. So he was, and it went on with the book. So he said, oh, she said, it can't be worse than, so you got, so I went, so in the, between the shows, they sort of pushed me through it and we rehearsed it. He comes on there, she comes on, the cow comes on it. Jack and the baby started eventually. I went on for the evening. Well, it was absolutely hysterical because I, I knew nothing. I didn't know where I was, where the show was, anything. You know, I stood in the middle of the stage. Because then the audience thought it was marvellous to see all hell, this chaos going, going on. I remember in the kitchen scene where he, where he comes back and said he sold the cow. I couldn't find the door to get in. Because backstage, he's just like a canvas, you know. And I tried this door, what I thought was the door, and it wasn't. It was the window. And I, so I climbed into the window, <laughs> and that Jackley said, "The door's over there." You see. <laughs> it normally comes at all, so I got back out the window, came in the door, all those sort of things. But they're, you know, great experience. And another time, a little lovely Panto story was I was in Manchester, and I used to do this sketch called the Comedy Band, which was a lineup of um, uh, pantomime characters but supposedly a brass band. So there used to be five or six people on stage, uh, if you, so you can imagine. So on the end was was the dame dressed as a Salvation Army girl, and the next was uh, another whoever so any, whoever it was playing um, a trombone or a trumpet or something. So they went along, and, and five or six characters, and the character looking at the stage on the right was usually a Scotsman in a full re- Scottish regalia, with a busby, no, with a tam o' shanter, and a gammy foot. <laughs> like you've got Hayden. <laughs> Thank Hayden's you. got a gammy foot, listeners. <laughs> um, a left foot. Um, but it was, you know, with a great big um, light, right, uh, light coloured gammy foot. And it would stick out, obviously, like a sore thumb. And then I would be next to it with hobnail boots on. Pretending to kick the foot. That was the sketch. It was, all, it was an old Sid Millwall sketch. The comedy band it was called. And the end of the sketch was that I would hit the stick, hit, hit, the, hit the bad foot with this, um, with this drumstick, you know, with a big beater on it. Because I was playing the big drum on the end. So we get to Manchester. And Dallas boys are playing the characters. And I have Billy Dainty on the end. And I'm on the other end with the big drum. And the end of the sketch was the fellow that was conducting was the feed for the sketch, the straight man. I'd got, I'd done it all wrong as usual, and he grabbed the stick out of my hand and he threw it on the ground, on the stage, and it went between the Scotsman's legs. So the <laughs> gag was, I went down on my knees, lay on my back, gently looked on the, under the kilt, with the stick, just looked at the kilt, got up, looked at the audience. And on the back of the drum, the big bass drum, I used to turn it round, and it said, no. (laughs) That was the gap, right? So it's Christmas Eve, Palace Manchester. The fella stood there with the Scotch kilt, gummy foot, and he throws the stick on the floor. And I got down on the floor, and I looked up the kilt, and there was all twinkling fairy lights. (laughs) 
the fellow that's doing the kilt, <laughs> all his twinkling, nothing else on underneath, twinkling flare lights, and a sign which said, Merry Christmas, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get up off the floor. <laughs> I couldn't get up. I was in hysterics. They had, to, they had to do the blackout early. But the audience didn't know what I was mm. doing, you know. But that was a f- the gag they did on me. It was terrible, terrible. That was the Dallas boys. <laughs> do you love and that? they'd rigged him up. The funny thing was, I knew something was going was happening, <laughs> but I never guessed it would be there. <laughs> and they, they, w- w- just as I was getting down, they sort of plugged him in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> From behind him, but um, there was some there was some wonderful wonderful gags in it, just fabulous. I was the one wearing the busby. Uh, my, my abode was my, my uh, mode of dress was this busby with a loincloth and green tights and huge hobnail boots, and that was my that's that was my uh, dress for that particular for that particular sketch. But there were some there were some wonderful gags in it. I had, I had this gag where I had some hairspray. So, you know, the, wearing the busby, and I was to spray the hairspray <laughs> right on my hair. Uh, and then I did it as an ad lib because I had a friend in the audience who who had a bouffant hairstyle, <laughs> and she was in this particular night. And I thought I'll do the gag with the hairspray on the busby. You see, so and then I sprayed my hair, and I sprayed the, the Scotsman with the sporran, and I sprayed his sporran. And then put the thing away, put the hairspray away, and the sporran started to move. <laughs> we rigged it up, so this became a later gig. The sporran started to go up and down. It moved up and down, and I got this gun. And, and I shot the sporran, and it used to come down very slowly as it was dying. And we all just stand to attend. <laughs> and salute, and, all, and the band used to play dun 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 dun. dun. <laughs> all those gags, you know, just marvellous, great panto gags. You speak about pantomime with such affection. Absolutely. Would you ever consider treading the boards? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't done panto for. I mean, the last one I did, I produced for Dougie Chapman over in, or oh, directed it over in Preston, and. Um, uh, as I say, I I actually love directing Panto. I just love it, and I love working with the performers and getting them to do stuff. I I don't know if I've got the energy to go and do a Panto now. You know, at my age, I um I probably could do a Baron and stuff. You know, you've never but been tempted to be Dame. I've been asked to do Dame. I've never done Dame. I've never actually done Dame. I always thought it was a lot of hard work. Actually, it is hard work. to to do Dame because you've got to have all the costumes and all the changes mm. and everything to make it work um, I was offered it once I actually couldn't do it when I was offered it I actually couldn't do it I was doing something else but I offered a lot of money to do it but I've never actually done it no So have you always got on with the people that you've worked with in pantomime? In the main yes but we've always been very good mates um, I suppose like any profession you know there, there can always be you know, oil and water sometimes. I had a, I had a, I don't know whether I had a problem with this certain person, but she definitely had a problem with me, I think. And that was, uh, we were working in um, Oxford in Panto. It was called, it was Jack and the Beanstalk with Joyce Blair. Now, it wasn't necessarily her fault that all this happened. It, it was just a combination of, well, t- Bad and no direction for the panto. I mean, I, I was just, you know, in it. But um, we had a director who, who sadly was also directing another panto at the same time. And the other pantomime was in Leeds. So we were in Oxford and he was in Leeds doing Dick Emery. Well, directing Dick Emery. <laughs> and <laughs> what happened was we did two days of rehearsal in Oxford and then he disappeared, the director, to Leeds. And Dick Emery wouldn't let him go. Literally wouldn't let him go. He said, oh, you've got to stay here and do a mouth. You can go and finish it off. And he didn't come back to us till virtually the dress rehearsal. So we had to cobble it together ourselves. Now, because there was nobody actually in charge of the thing, you know, people were do, sort of doing their own thing. And bless her, Joyce, Joyce Blair decided that she was going to sing every time she came on 
And um, and we all know that more than once or twice, songs can be quite boring in pantomime, particularly ballads and stuff. And so I'd said, I think there's too many songs in the show. So when he came back, the director, he said... <clears throat> Um, he saw what we'd, he saw what we'd, what, what we'd put and cobbled together, and I'd said to him, "Look, uh, Malcolm, do you not think there's too many songs in the show?" He said, "Unfortunately, they've all been set now, and I can't do anything about it." So I said, "Yeah, but you're the director, and you can see that it's all wrong." Anyway, I very kindly asked her, "Would she cut a couple of these songs?" She was doing loads of them, and she said, "No." See, so I said, "Okay." Um, you're doing all the things you... I said, it's not a case of doing the things I want to do. I said, they're relevant to the pantomime. I said, you're singing songs for no reason at all. Just no reason, just because you can sing. Anyway, uh, we, we, we finished up not in the best of friends, sadly. And there's a story that that is repeated in one of Roy Hood's books that we were having a slight contraton on the side of the stage. <laughs> and... At that moment, <laughs> the stage manager said, you're on, both of you. And we both walked on, and the song we had to sing as we walked on was Friends. <laughs> Isn't it rather nice to have friends? <laughs> and we came off and roared, the two of us. We roared. It was Lana bless, sister bless her. I mean, I have to say that at the end of the day, we did finish up as good friends. But at the time, it was very funny, and it all becomes terribly serious. <laughs> I worked with Barbara Windsor in Panto. I have to say she's probably one of the most hardest working performers and a great performer in pantomime. She was also Aladdin, played Wishy at the Alhambra Bradford. And we had we had an awful lot of fun together. We had we had a great time. It was during that season, um at the, at the Alhambra that I wrote a I wrote a song. Not that I'm a songwriter or <laughs> or professed to be, but it was for Harry Ramsden's Fish and Chip Shop. It was the weirdest <laughs> thing. We were, we were invited as a pantomime cast to go to Harry Ramsden's Christmas party, which wasn't in the Fish and Chip Shop. It was in a very nice hotel in Ilkley. So we get along there, and I know that I'm going to be asked to get up and say a few words, so I did, and I'd, uh, I, I asked the musical director, Will Fife. Uh, junior, would he dot down the top line? So he did of this little. So I wrote this little song. It went like this: We're all going to Harry Ramsden's, Harry Ramsden's for our teas. We're all going to Harry Ramsden's, and we're having mushy peas. And I thought I'll I'll do it, and I'll get them all to join in and sing. Anyway, a little bit later in the evening, um, the the managing director of the company was then. I think they were called Associated Fisheries, who owned Harry Ramson. He came over to me and he said, do you think that song would make a bit of a record? And I said, well, not without a verse and a lot of work put into it. So he said, um, well, let's see what you can do. So I completed the song and it became the ballad of Harry Ramson. And I think they gave them away, made the record, and they gave them away uh, during Jubilee year in the fish and chip shop. And it was called uh, The Ballad of Harry Ramsden's. And I wanted Ronnie Hilton to do it because he was a Yorkshire lad. But no, they insisted that I did the song. So uh, so I did. And I used the whole company in the Panto Company as the chorus. So they all got, they didn't actually get paid, but they could have done. But we had a party with it. We had a great last night party with the money that the record produced. It was very good. So that was the Barbara Windsor one. But one final story I'm going to tell you is a disaster story because it happened on the last night of Manchester Palace, Panto, with Anita Harris. And we had suffered throughout the run from three-day weeks, blackouts, not being able to have proper lighting in the show, all that mm. was going on. And we get to the last night, 1971, right in the middle of the performance. In the interval, the manager came round and he said, well, before the interview came round, he said, we're going to have to take the show off. I said, why? He said, there's been a bomb scare. I said, it's the last night. You know, everybody was going to have a party. It was all good. No. He said, I can't do anything about it. So he said, I'm going to, I have to make the announcement and we have to vacate the theatre. He said, and there's no point in getting them back in again. He said, it's just going to take an hour to do it properly. So we were all had to go out of the theatre in the interval all in our costumes and makeup, outside in Oxford Street in Manchester, 
outside the theatre. I mean, the punters all drifted off and went home. It was it was a very sad finish to the season. But one one funny thing was the the genie of the ring in a green face <laughs> in a, and was rather camp. Was stood outside and this Mancuni went up to him and he said, "What have you come as?" <laughs> this is outside <laughs> outside the Palace Manchester. He said, I'm the fairy of the ring. What are you, darling? (laughs) (laughs) And with that, I endeth the first lesson. (laughs) Thank you. Any regrets over your career? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we all have regrets about stuff that's gone wrong or didn't work or whatever, you know. But um, overall, nearly all the things that I've managed to do over the years and I've had several careers I mean I started out doing stand-up and then uh, switched and went into management in the 80s and and late 80s I went over to America and did um, cruise directing worked on cruise ships and booked them and everything then came back in the 90s and started an acting career um, which which I uh, which I've, I've really enjoyed, although although I, I was never really what I really wanted to do. But I've, I've, enjoyed, I've enjoyed everything I've done, really, over the years. When I look back on it, I look on it back with with affection. Yeah, I look on with great affection. Um, and and I miss a lot of my mates who have now gone, bless them, you know, people like Bernie Breslau and, and Billy Dainty. And I remember them, you know, with, with great affection. We were we were good pals, and worked well together. And and to work with these people was, you know, was um, was really wonderful, amazing. Well, this leads me to my very last question: your dream pantomime. You can be in it. You can be sitting in the stalls watching it. You can choose the production, the theatre it's in, and the cast can be alive or dead. I think Cinderella is the greatest panto to do. It's got all the ingredients. It's a bit of a female panto in as much as it appeals to the feminine, to the little girls, because it's a fairy princess. Um, I mean, things like Robinson Crusoe and Aladdin are male orientated. And Jack, Jack and the Beanstalk are male orientated, but Cinderella, a has got the the, 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 the the Disney princess, fairy princess in it, who she becomes a fairy princess despite all the odds. So you've got that story going on, and you can have the comedy with the sister, ugly sisters, and the Baron and Buttons, and there's lovely pathos in Cinderella, um, which I've always tried to which I've always tried to bring out the pathos and the surprises. Um, and then in the old days, you used to have, well, you still do in some respects, you know, some lovely white ponies to come on with a golden coach. And there's all that aspect of it as well, which is nice. And then the second half with the ball and, you know, it's all traditional and trying on a slipper mm. and everything. But, but they've re- when, you, when you think of all the pantos that you've done, I think I've enjoyed that more than anything. Doing it and being in it. Um, I suppose a dream cast would be not far from the one I I put together for Leicester. Not far. Um, I suppose Billy Dainty was the best dame. Really a very, very good, great face, great teeth, wonderful stage presence. Um, also, like Jack Tripp was a very good dame, very very good dame. The first dame, I think I worked with was Sonny Jenks, who was an old fashioned dame uh, uh, from the days of you know the twenties and thirties, and had a different sort of career in panto. And the, the sad thing about working with an old dame is, is they have got a certain way of working, and it may be that. You know, it's become a bit passe. That's the sad thing. And sometimes 
the older performers look on the younger performers and and don't see if what they've got to offer before they condemn mm. you know i found that with quite a few old performers that they had a you know a set way of doing things over the years um so that's that's really it i i think of today's modern performers um panto performers i think bradley walsh is probably one of the best you know all round ad lib good comics today i love bradley i'm i'm so pleased he's doing so well i don't know if the modern comics you would be able to take to panto really because they, they probably don't need to do that much hard work you know twice daily mm. Is is hard work, you know. It really is hard work, particularly if you're not used to doing it. It's hard work when you are used to doing it. And a lot of these pantos, sometimes they do three in a day. Some of them do four in a day. I don't know how they do it, but they do. Um, but uh, so so Cinderella. Um, I th I think one of the best pantomime performers I ever saw work was Terry Scott. I saw Terry at the Palladium and other pantos playing Dame, and I worked with him in the BBC Panto, and he was great to work with. When we, we did the comedy band, and he said, I want to be the straight man, I want to feed this, because I know where all the gags are. Mm. So the best feeds are comedians, because they know where the gags are. That's generous, though, isn't it, of them as well? It is, but if you want to be part of it, see, to be a, to be a, a, lot, a lot of people say, oh, the straight man is doesn't get any laughs. That's irrelevant, because in a double act, you're part of the act. You are part. You you make the comic better. The better you are as a feed, you make the comic better. If you think about Eric and Ernie, you say Ernie was the perfect feed because you, he tried to. He, he pretended as if he was being funny, and he actually wasn't. But he, it was on purpose. It was an acting performance, and it made Eric funnier. You know, being able to slap mm. him with a little fiery leg. <laughs> there was a lot of comedy that happened between the two of them. It was a it was a knowledge between the two. I mean, Mark and Bernie were like that, you know. But Mike was never the... It was always a straight man. He was quite a good musician. And Bernie was the, the silly, silly, gumpy character, you know. But any of those double acts, you see, um, Jimmy Jewell and Ben Warris. You see, Ben was a great comedy character and very, very good in pantomime. The two of them were. I mean, they came up in a different era. They came up with, you know, different comedic... Talents, you know, they were they were great comics, absolutely great comics. But it's a very good question about what would what would be my ideal cast and the people I, you know, well, I thought Terry Scott was very good. Um, that was that was a dream cast, the BBC Panto that I I actually helped to put that together, which was nice. Um, Anita Harris played Robin Hood, traditional principal boy. Terry Scott and Hugh Lloyd played the robbers. Um, Donna was made Marion. I just played the character Samuel Tweet because at that time I was doing the Tweet series, so I just played that silly Samuel Tweet. Mm. Billy was the dame. Billy Dainty was the dame. And the best baddie, of course, was uh, evil man was Alan Curtis, just a marvelous villain, wonderful villain. Um, so that really was a bit of a dream cast as well. Yeah, that was it. It was just a great panel. We did a very funny schoolroom scene with um, uh, Hugh Lloyd and Terry Scott. But Terry was great. He would do the gag and get off. He would say, don't labour it, do the gag. I loved, I loved his attitude towards the comedy. Don't, don't delay it, get on with it, get off, do the gag and get off, you know. And, he, and I loved that attitude, you know. When we first worked together, he said, he said we're going to get on well together. Could you feel the same way as I about it? He said, yeah. He said, all the gags are old. Get off and do them, you know. <laughs> so we did, and we had, uh, we had a lot of fun. And I said that he, he did the feed for the comedy band, and he was great, absolutely great, lovely. So that was a good cast. That was a very good cast. But we only did it, you only do it once, BBC Panto. You rehearse it, do a dress rehearsal, do it once, matinee. And we used to do it at Wimbledon Theatre. And that was it, really. So, um, yeah, that was that was enjoyable to do. But the lovely thing about doing something for the BBC is that they make all the props. So if you say, I want this mirror to crack, when, when the dame looks in it, they'll make it crack, you know. So it was, it was great because they made all the props for real, which is wonderful. Where would you like your production to be held? Palladium. That's, that is the fabulous, wonderful venue. I asked people, what was it like 
to perform on that hallowed stage. Oh, it's just, it's just amazing. The, the lovely thing about the Palladium is that it, it is made for variety. It is. A, it always was a variety theatre. It was never intended as anything else. I mean, they put musicals on it and stuff, but it's just, just a wonderful variety theatre. And I did five day, five weeks there with Cliff Richard, in the middle of the summer. Never a seat to be found. Couldn't get in. It's just wonderful. To, he, he's always been one of the biggest draws in uh, in the country, and I remember seeing it. I think I saw him there in pantomime. To Cliff, just he was just absolutely wonderful. I, I remember seeing Norman Wisdom in Panto at the Palladium, and I thought that the way he got into his act uh, was just just absolutely beautifully written. He did. He played Aladdin, and when he when Aladdin gets all his riches and his fame, he's wandering about in the palace, and he and he said, you know. I'm, and he rubbed the lamp and the genie came and he said to the genie, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. Tell me what's going to happen in the future. So the genie said, Master, many strange things will happen in the future. There will be flying birds that people can ride in. And they will be called aeroplanes. So he said, show me one. And, a, and a, um, a cloth came in, like a screen, and a film came out of an aeroplane. He said, this is what will happen in the future, Master. So he said, and um, who will entertain us? And he said, this man. And Norman Wisdom came on the screen. You know, Norman Wisdom. And he said, he's funny, isn't he? <laughs> so he said, yes, Master. He said, bring him here now. And it was a flash thing. And, Norman, and, and then blackout. And when the lights came on, normal wisdom in a little suit was wandering about mm. the stage. Right? You know, falling about and everything. Huge applause, huge mm. applause. And then Norman came on as as um, Aladdin. And he said, who are you? So she said, oh, I'm Norman. It was a wonderful moment. And, and he said, who are you? He said, I... I'm very wealthy Aladdin. Oh, are you? He said, are you funny? He said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> he said, I want to be you. And there was a flash and he took the costume off and he's dressed exactly like Normal Wisdom. And they were identical. There's a fellow called Ken Wilson. Did a very good impression of Normal Wisdom. And he looked just like him. And that's what he did. And that's how he got into his act. And he said, I want to be you for 10 minutes. And the other fellow went off and he did his act. How brilliant. Yeah. What a wonderful way to get into your act. So I tried to do it. I tried to do it in Manchester and it failed <laughs> miserably. It was awful. I tell you what, just terrible. I, I, um, I, I rubbed the lamp. The same fellow wrote the script for Manchester as wrote the Palladium one. I rubbed the lamp. The genie came on and said, what's going to happen in the future? And he said, there are many strange things happen and there will be a fun little man called Parrotface. <laughs> <laughs> See? And, and as he started to talk, I went down in the trap. Right? <laughs> Just my head above the trap and I said, and he said, and I said, what, are you, what will he be like? And he said, he will wear a funny hat and be called Parrot Face. And he gave me the hat, and I put the hat on, and the trap sprung up, and I came out and didn't. I didn't. I didn't change costume. I, I just wore the, the um, pantomime costume, you know. But it didn't work at all. It was terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> well, Freddie, thank you so much for taking part in the podcast. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you.